All right. Well, everybody, we're going to go ahead and kick things off because I believe it is nine o'clock. If my phone is telling me correctly, actually, two minutes passed over here. Please stand up here so our virtual participants can also see me. So thank you all so much for joining us today, whether you're attending in person for the OER Summit here at Rose State College or to our virtual attendees. It's really great to see you all, and I'm so glad that you were able to sign in this morning. Um, this is actually, I believe, the third year that we've done the summit. That's correct, Kathy. Yeah, I always look at you because you're my history book for the OER. <laughs> But this is a really amazing event, and I'm excited that we have an opportunity to try this out in person for the very first time today. And we have a pretty awesome slate of presenters that are going to be joining us, some of whom will be here with us in person. And we also have a couple of our, uh, presenters who will join us virtually uh, from Canada. I know from Pressbooks with John. Uh, we actually have to do a demo of a tool called Pressbooks Results later. And I think one of our other presenters from NSU is also going to sign in and join us virtually. So um, please come in and join us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Brad here, but if I haven't had an opportunity to meet you all yet, and I serve as you, if you join the session, maybe crazy. Um, and I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Innovation for the Oklahoma State Regions for Higher Education. Uh, I actually started in 2019 in the role of Director of Online Learning, which has kind of evolved a little bit over time to include our Reach Higher Adult Degree Completion Program, as well as micro-credentials, online learning, and this project as well for open educational resources. And you can imagine having the blender of all of those projects getting to come together. There's some really exciting things that we get to work on with the innovation team at the Regents. I'm also joined here today by a number of colleagues from uh, our staff, including Tracy Romano, just sitting down here at the front and serves as our man uh, manager of academic workforce and online. Uh, we have Brittany Blake, who's also out in the hallway, who you may have met before, who's our project manager for academic affairs. Debbie Myrick out front as well, who's our staff assistant for the innovation team. And we'll also be joined by two of our other colleagues from the Reach Hire team a little bit later this morning. So I hope you'll take a chance to meet the Reach staff who are working in these various areas um, and talk about the projects if you're interested at all in any of those things that I've discussed. We also have some information that's been put out front for those of you that are joining us here today as far as the flyers about these opportunities, grants that we have available, which I know you're going to hear about throughout the day. Uh, as far as other information, too, that may be of interest to you. So um, I did want to also mention specifically that this is a hybrid event, and we've actually worked pretty hard to try to close the gap between our virtual attendees and the people that are here with us today. So every one of you that is in the in-person audience today should have received an email this morning that you've been pre-registered for the virtual event. And if you actually scan the QR code that's on your table, you'll be able to join the virtual Zoom events platform from your phone and interact with the participants that are attending with us outside of the building today. So uh, you can even build your session on there if you want to keep things virtual. We do have paper programs that are also printed and available out in the lobby if you'd like that. Uh, but I would encourage you to use the Zoom events platform and we're going to ask you for some feedback probably on what your experience was like because uh, we're trying to decide how best to move forward with these kinds of hybrid events, uh, especially because we have our other Learning Innovation Summit coming up on April 26th, right here in the same space at Florida State College. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first presentation of the morning, uh, which is going to be presented <laughs> by Rolinda Ruby. Melinda and I have actually been colleagues, I think, for a couple of years now. And uh, we both are members of the Southern Regional Education Board's EdTech Cooperative. Uh, this is a group that meets quarterly. Come on up, Rolinda. Don't be shy. <laughs> no, but we meet quarterly, actually. And Rolinda and I travel sometimes to Atlanta or other places and get with other state leaders and talk about educational technology topics. And one of the topics that we have actually voted on as a top 10 issue or opportunity within EdTech is open educational resources. Rolinda has a really captivating story that she's going to share with you all today about the progress that's been made at her community college, which is the University of Arkansas's Cossetop Community College. So uh, I think many of you that are in this room that work at rural community colleges or four-year universities are really going to find this story compelling and I think see things that you can adapt from these strategies uh, while they 
coming in, those of you that work at larger institutions are also going to see a lot of promise here as well. So we're going to go ahead and get Melinda's slides queued up and uh, with the presentation there and underway. But I would encourage you all once again to interact with each other during the presentations today using the chat function uh, through the Zoom meeting. Or again, we will have the microphone and moderators available in person here as well during each of the sessions that occur. The final thing that I do want to mention for the in-person attendees today is there's actually been a minor change as far as the way that the rooms are lettered, I should say, uh, within this building. Last year when we were here, I believe that it was actually A, B, and C uh, that were associated next to each other, and Rose has actually reversed that the opposite direction. So uh, just keep in mind that the letters or kind of room assignments that are in the program do still apply. You'll still go to ballroom B or ballroom C, but if you're here last year and we're expected the opposite direction, it's no it's does anybody have any questions or things that we should address before we turn it over to Melinda to get us started? Yeah. When we enter the Zoom room, will we be automatically muted? You should be, and if not, I would appreciate it if you would okay. you know, help us support some feedback. And if anybody is there, would you mind checking the chat for our virtual Let's See if there's any questions from them. No, all good? Okay. Well, Melinda, let's go ahead and get it switched over here. We just got a Zoom crash message on our laptop up here. So. <laughs> Technology. Love it. Right, so that's <laughs> That yeah, we're gonna or you can use your uh, pointer there too. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, okay, Brad. Thanks for getting everything set up, ready to go. Um, initially, I was just going to talk about how we started an innovative tech book rental an OER program at a small college in Southwest Arkansas. But I attended OE Global a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to bring in a few things from that that I found really inspirational, um, things we need to consider while we encourage the use of OER. So before we get started, I want you to see this question, and I want you to keep it in your mind. Uh, because we're going to go back to it later. Think about what open education really is. 
What is it to you? What does it mean? And what prompted your interest in open education? It's unacceptable that over 2 million high school graduates could not complete college because of the cost. It's no wonder students can't afford college when the cost of textbooks increased over a thousand percent, a thousand percent between 1977 and 2015. The price of textbooks always comes up in OER conversations, but we're here to talk about something more important than just textbooks. We're here to talk about making higher education accessible to all and how any college, big or small, can use OER to remove financial barriers for students and still maintain academic quality, all while offering faculty more academic freedom. On this graph, you can see how federal funding decreased and student contributions increased from 1990 to 2015. <clears throat> now statewide, this is Arkansas. State funding decreased while student contributions increased nearly doubling between 92 and 2016. And, and here's Oklahoma. Not only did state funding decrease by about 40% from 92 to 2016, but tuition contributions increased. Are you ready? 140%. That's a lot. About two thirds of students borrow to get through school. These borrowers graduate with an average debt of almost 40,000. In Oklahoma, the average is about 32,000. The average student spends $1,200 to nearly $1,500 for textbooks per year. At Rose State College, the cost is about $1,000. And at UA Casa Tot, the cost is about $300. <laughs> now, I, I dispute that. Uh, it's actually cheaper but that's what's listed on the web, uh, so I included it. And I'll explain why it's cheaper shortly. So let's hear a student's perspective on textbook expenses. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Copy and paste it and You know what? Almost oh, there. We need to. There it is. Stuck poop can make thin women feel plus sized. To have the all the ads to pop. No kidding. Thank you. Best poop of your life. You don't need fiber. You that don't have to sit in some weird not a business student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking 
going around and really asking people who have taken the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford Support it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative <laughs> loans from my brothers. Uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, so I, I, I just go back to the PowerPoint. And for all the other presenters that are here, I'll try to make sure that have two happen to you. Here it is. All right. I'm so sorry, Linda. No, it's okay. Just that. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what this student talks about. Um, he's at Minnesota, and he can't afford the textbooks, and he calls it a second tuition. He was shocked when he got to college. He knew he came from Michigan and Minnesota. He knew it was going to be expensive. But the textbooks was just a shock. And and I love that he calls it a second tuition because I hear that from students a lot. Um, at Casa Top, before we started our program, some students were actually paying more for their textbooks. Virtual attendees, please make sure your microphones are muted. Thank you. They were paying more for their textbooks than they were for tuition. And that's just unacceptable. But he was explaining some of the things they did. They would share a textbook, four to five students. They pitch in, they buy the textbook and share it. He ended up with a 3 a.m. time slot. So he got the book like between 3 and 5 a.m. That's sad. I mean, I can't imagine not being able to study the material and having to study, get up at three o'clock in the morning to study. And being in college, he probably didn't get to bed till 1 a.m. So that's kind of what the video is about. Merlin, I'm sorry, Bobby. <laughs> the virtual attendees are having a little trouble hearing when you move away from the mic. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and feel free to take it off there if you want to hold it too. It'll separate. I'm, I'm usually so loud that I usually don't use use a, a mic. But uh, anyway, the video, it, it's depressing. And as educators, we've got to figure out how to address this issue. We have to be able to offer affordable access to higher education. These are some of the ways that students avoid purchasing expensive textbooks. But these actions usually affect academic performance, as we well know. And these are the results of a 2016 survey from Florida Virtual Campus. Over half of the students opted not to buy a required textbook, even though they knew they might fail the course. Others shared textbooks like the student in the video. So what can we do? We can't really do much about uh, tuition and fees or even room and board, uh, but there's something that we can do. We can look at books and supplies. It's not the highest cost leading to affordability issue, but it is the one cost that faculty can impact and it has a special impact on the academic success of students, as we'll see later. I gotta turn our slides back on because it's still on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, this is gonna be a real test for you today. Yeah. Well, it's still Zoom, but uh, not our customary devices. <laughs> And it should be back on there now for virtual. So there are a couple of ways that we can lower textbook expenses. One way is to develop an internal textbook rental program or to work closely with existing bookstores. And this, especially in the bigger colleges, they need their bookstores. Uh, a lot of good relationships are being built with OER, with bookstores. Um, sometimes we tend to demonize 
the bookstores, and that, and that's not really necessary. Uh, a lot of times they have nothing to do with those expenses. The most dangerous phrase in the language. When we first began our internal textbook rental and OER program at UA Cossata, I can't tell you how many times I heard this. But we've always done it this way. We've always used textbooks. I'll be honest, at the time, it just annoyed me. I was always prone to think that people cling to the past because they're scared of change. But at OE Global a couple of weeks ago, I realized how wrong I was. I listened to a young man speaking about indigenous culture. He explained that we can value natural and traditional culture while embracing modern ways of thinking. We can respect both with different perspectives and recognize that we're not bound by either. The past always guides us to the future. So when you hear that phrase the next time, remember traditional practices can blend with new ideas. Neither has to cancel the other out. OE Global also made me adjust my perspective because it made me consider all the different ways in which open education influences the future on a global stage. When I first became an OER advocate, I was primarily looking at it just from student affordability. At the time, I didn't consider all the possibilities open education creates. Open education addresses many of the challenges and the needs of contemporary and future learning environments. Some of the key reasons why open education is essential for the future of education includes encouraging lifelong learning and promoting a sense of belonging. To provide a little bit of background about how we began our journey to becoming an OER legend in Arkansas, <laughs> In 2013, when our longtime librarian retired, we transitioned the college library into an educational resource center. Our chancellor had a vision of creating an academic center that was inviting and served as a one-stop center for students. We combined the library and the college's tutoring center to create what we now call the ERC. We added private study rooms and we brightened up the area hoping to encourage students to spend time there. Within the first year, we increased student usage of the college's library and tutoring resources by 600%. You may be wondering what all this has to do with OER. The ERC plays a major role in OER at UA Tosca and we'll get to that. In 2014, we really started paying attention to the fact that our students were paying up to $1,400 per year on textbooks. Like most colleges, an outside company operated a bookstore on our campus. Arkansas has a 16% poverty rate, and many of our students struggle with finances. We knew we had to find a way to lower or eliminate textbook costs while maintaining high academic quality. We began to research OER. Some of our faculty were already using open resources or developing their own before OER was really a thing, so it wasn't an entirely foreign concept. OER advocates will often say that support from administration is one of the most important factors when you're considering OER. We agree. You need administrative support.
and still You know, I just not wrong here. You should be good to go. Thanks. Okay. So we offered a five hundred dollars stipend to our faculty members who were willing to forego textbooks and use OER instead. I spent the entire summer of two thousand fifteen procuring textbooks. I don't mean eight hours a day. I mean about eighteen hours a day, seven days a week. But we did it. That meant I was buying one or two books at a time through <laughs> Amazon, Alibris, wherever I could find them. So it was a lot of work. At first, it wasn't clear how we were going to get the books to the students and keep up with all the transactions. We thought about requiring faculty to handle distribution, but we knew that was going to cause a lot of conflict. So ERC staff stepped up to the plate and volunteered to not only handle procurement, but to manage the program entirely. <clears throat> I told you that ERC plays a major role in OER at UA Costco. Even though we were still using some textbooks, OER was really our primary focus. When we started our OER initiative, we knew we needed to take some important steps to build a successful OER program. These are some of the steps that we took to build our program and especially to sustain it. I had a lot to learn about OER and building OER initiatives in higher education. Once I had the textbooks ready to go, I began building a plan for OER that we could follow. We'll look at each of these steps individually. Even if you already have an OER program, you can use some of these steps and even expand on them to add additional sub-steps. The first thing we did is research OER information and collect data about OER adoption in Arkansas. It turns out there wasn't much information being shared about OER in the state. I gathered a lot of information from Spark and OpenStax, and I quickly became a fan of David Wiley and Cable Green. We also looked closely at case studies from institutions that were using OER effectively. I can't tell you how many folders I created to store all of this information I was gathering. I shared much of it with our faculty as I came across it. After researching, the next thing was to identify our key stakeholders. For us, the most important stakeholder is our students. We conducted some surveys to find out what our students thought about OER, all of which was positive except for a few holdouts for traditional textbooks. They wanted something in their hands. I offered to hand them a book, but they, they wanted that textbook. In order to build a successful OER program, it's imperative that administration and faculty are on board. You cannot do it without their support. We considered different perspectives and adjusted our procedures <laughs> based on the feedback we received. It was never an okay, we're all done now project. Eight years later, we are still adjusting and building as we learn new things. In our first year using our new program, our faculty accepted the Chancellor's Challenge and used OER to develop 38 courses. We paid $19,000 in stipends during the first year. 
After only three semesters, UA Cossacot was 35% OER. Not only were we the first college in the state to develop an internal textbook <laughs> rental program, but we also became the leader in OER usage among two-year colleges. Many scholars are still concerned about OER effects on academic quality. And if you know someone who is concerned about that, you can refer to these studies. 13 different academic studies measured results <laughs> pertaining to student learning. None showed results in which students who used OER performed worse than their peers who were using traditional <clears throat> textbooks. In fact, of almost 120,000 students, 95% had the same or better outcomes. OER does not have to sacrifice academic quality. After only two years, our students saved almost $700,000, and we were 44% OER. We began to share our successes and our challenges with other colleges. After all, that's what OER is about, sharing knowledge. The third step in building advocacy in Arkansas meant developing partnerships and alliances. We knew that we could learn a lot from collaborating with other colleges and organizations who supported OER adoption. We began researching which groups might help us expand our program, and we built a strong network of OER advocates. That is something that never stops. Every time I attend a conference, my network expands. I learn something from everyone I meet, and I hope that I'm able to share information with them as well. We knew we needed someone to learn more about Creative Commons and OER. So that spring, I submitted a proposal listing reasons why we should join the Open Textbook Network, now known as the Open Education Network. All the research I accessed showed that we could learn so much from them. We needed to be better. Our program worked, our faculty were on board, our students were on board, but we knew we could do better. So we did. In August 2018, UA Cossacot became the first college in Arkansas to join the Open Textbook Network. And OER-wise, it was probably one of the best decisions we ever made. One of the most important steps in building OER advocacy is to raise awareness. The first thing I learned from the OTN is to create an elevator speech. I did. But after some time, I began to notice that people were trying to go the other way whenever they saw me coming. <laughs> this, this is a true story. <laughs> I took every opportunity I had to talk about OER and how our program was working. I also began presenting at conferences like this to help with the crucial step of raising awareness. Don't ever stop talking about OER. They'll hide from you at first, but they'll warm up to it. We began offering OER training for our faculty. I created a library guide to help faculty quickly locate OER material. Every time I received notice of a webinar or a professional development opportunity, I shared that with faculty. It helps to create tutorials for them, and it's really important to create positions for OER specialists or tech to help faculty and to review OER courses. We require that any course using OER is set up in our LMS, even if it's a brick and mortar course. It's an ideal place to store all the material and it makes it easier to review. Now that we were a part of the OTM, and we had access to so much OER experience and training opportunities, it was time to learn more about the Creative Commons. 
I took an online course and completed the CC certification course in 2019. I think I was in the second grade to take the course. It helped us to be able to provide better guidance for our faculty and to review OER courses more efficiently. Just as I was finishing up the Creative Prompt Commons training, I was notified that I was selected to be on the OTN steering committee for a two-year term. It was a great experience, and we continue to learn more about OER. One of the most important pieces of advice I give to other colleges getting into OER is to join the Open Education Network. In the meantime, Amidst all the training and learning, by the end of the 2018-19 academic year, student savings were almost at $1.5 million, <clears throat> and we were 54% OER. Remember I talked about offering faculty training earlier? We also began using the Open Washington OER modules to help train faculty. We use Blackboard as an LMS, so it worked for best for us in that platform. And we require faculty to go through the training before developing a course using OER. I've listed that URL just in case you haven't ran across that. By this time, we had increased faculty stipends to $1,000. It was the right thing to do. If it weren't for faculty, the program would never work as well as it did. But if there's one thing community colleges have in common, it's limited budgets. Since we weren't actually writing open textbooks, but adopting already existing OER, it was almost impossible to find funding. So we had to find a way to get funding for OER. Hello, Title III grant. In 2019, we submitted a Title III Strengthening Institutions Program grant application. We included five goals, with one being to improve retention and graduation rates by making our ERCs bigger and better. Yes, there's the ERC again. On October 1st, 2020, we were notified that we were awarded a $2.2 million Title III grant. By now, the ERC is a merger of four departments, and we needed that funding to improve its services for students, but it also gave us funding for OER, because remember where the textbook and OER program lives. One of the ERC objectives in the grant is to continue increasing the use of OER. We also earmark funds specifically for faculty stipends and training. We needed to obtain funding so we could offer a more substantial incentive to encourage faculty to adopt OER. The stipend was raised to $1,500. We also knew that my training needed to continue as well as our commitment to encouraging others to join the OER movement. Once we received the Title III grant, we knew that OER funding was covered for the next five years. There should be funding opportunities available to community colleges interested in adopting already existing OER, not just the institution where faculty are writing the textbooks. Colleges have to provide stipends for faculty and be able to pay for training opportunities. Unfortunately, it's the students who pay for the lack of available OER funding. If colleges can't access the funds to pay faculty, they struggle to offer OER at all. While we were working hard to find more efficient ways to run our textbook rental and OER program, we learned that our students had saved over two and a quarter million dollars with our program. We were also 65% OER by this time. 
zero to 60 in five years. <laughs> With 65% of our courses using OER only, we had the highest OER uses among colleges in Arkansas. It's a role that we're proud to have. 2.5 million sounded great, since our number one priority has always been our students. And that remains true for all UA Costa employees. During September 2022 to July 23, I was enrolled in the Kwantlen Polytechnic University's professional program in open education. It's a wonderful course. I recommend it for anyone interested in learning more about open education. Remember, the training never stops. I attend every conference that I can. And I often tell our story that other so that other colleges know just how beneficial OER really is. I mean, how can you lose? You're saving students millions, you're providing support for your faculty, and you're ensuring that the OER you select has the high academic quality that you expect. OER has come a long way since its early days. There are many research articles and case studies proving that students who use OER perform as well, often better than those using traditional textbooks. The main approach to expanding OER is getting the word out. First, seek administrative support. We're fortunate our chancellor is an OER advocate and encourages its use. Do the research, talk to faculty, network, Join groups dedicated to OER, like Creative Commons, the OEM. Create positions for OER specialists to help faculty with finding and selecting appropriate OER. Librarians are the catalyst to OER. Do we have any librarians in here? They, <laughs> they should always be involved in the OER process. And finally, show faculty that they will have more academic freedom with OER. Show the research that proves academic quality does not have to be lost. <clears throat> Another way to promote OER is collaboration between community colleges and K through 12. We should be talking about K through 16 open education. If a small <coughs> community college in Southwest Arkansas can pull this off, you can too. In 2013, we formed our ERC, which later became the hub for OER. In 2015, we added an internal textbook rental and OER program to the ERC. Since then, our students have saved $3.2 million. And we're not stopping there. We're already looking at more open educational practices like open pedagogy, scholarship, educational technologies that will all make higher education more accessible. In fact, we recently learned that we were selected to be a part of Rice University's OpenStax Institutional Partner Program for the 23-24 academic year. The sixth and final step in our advocacy program for Arkansas is building momentum. We never stop encouraging a culture of innovation and of collaboration. I still corner everyone I can with my elevator speech. I've spoken at many conferences, sharing our story and our experiences, both good and bad, and I never stop letting people know that OER is my jam. I'm always enthusiastic about OER. Here is an overview of what we accomplished at UA Cossacot since 2013. Although our OER program officially began in 2015, we always include the ERC's birth because it's where our OER program lives. Today, 71% of our courses are taught using OER and we lead Arkansas in OER usage. 
Someone once told me that I'm too enthusiastic about OER. There's no such thing as being too enthusiastic about something you love. So get excited about OER. You're all here. I know you love it. So get excited about it. Building this program from the ground up has been my, one of the most rewarding things I've done during my academic career. It's hard work. It's hectic. It's time consuming, but seeing our students' faces when we tell them you don't have to buy a textbook makes it all worthwhile. OER is about sharing knowledge and promoting freedom of content access, freedom to use, and freedom from cost. In 2023, every person should have access to education. Open education is the gateway to providing free access to learning, and everyone should have opportunities to learn. In addition to encouraging global sharing of knowledge, OER ensures the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Higher education shall be equally accessible to all. Remember that question I asked you from the beginning? There's not an absolute right answer. What matters is how you define the term. Always keep that in mind. What does open education really mean to you? How important is it to you? And I'd like to share a story here of why I became so passionate about OER. I mentioned that I worked in a bookstore for over five years. One year, a young lady came in and she didn't have any financial aid. And she was taking several classes. She needed books. Her books totaled over $400. So she came up to the counter. I, I pulled her books, set them all out, told her the price. She didn't write a check. She didn't have a credit card. She didn't pull out $100 bills. She was pulling out rolled pennies, rolled quarters, dollar bills. She was $40 short. Happy ending, I helped her out. I could not let her walk out of there because she had tears in her eyes and she told me she was gonna drop her classes that she couldn't afford them. That's why, that's why I love OER. For me, open education, represents a key to the future. The description that I most agree with comes from Dr. Blessinger at St. John's University and TJ Bliss at the Hewlett Foundation. Their article, Introduction to Open Education Toward a Human Rights Theory, was published in the International Journal of Open Educational Resources in the 2018-19 edition. While they describe open education with the most popular terms like accessibility, participation, experience, social inclusion, they also delve into the idea of lifelong learning being a human right. It's difficult for democracy to exist without education. And to continue democracy, we must treat education as a human right. We don't all come from the same socioeconomic backgrounds. We don't all experience the same opportunities. So to save democracy, we must create flexible and open educational structures that provide equal access to lifelong learning. These authors express the importance of open education much better than I can. But I do want to add, in my best Arkansas accent, <laughs> that sharing knowledge through open education is just one way that we protect future generations. And it's just the right thing to do. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, comments, discussion, I would love to hear how some of you became interested in OER. What's your story? I've shared mine. So any questions?
Thank you so much, Melinda. <clears throat> I, I've heard some of this story before, but I feel more inspired whenever I hear you talk about the work that you're doing. And um, I just want to say that I, Relentless from Southwest Arkansas, which is very close to Southeast Oklahoma. And I think that a lot of the context that she mentions is really similar to the things that I hear from you all every single day at your institutions, regardless of whether you're in a rural area or if you're in a metropolitan area, and maybe have at the Lauren Fund to do great things at your school. I think that these challenges all persist, but does anybody have any questions uh, from the audience here or comments that you might want to also make or things that you might want to share about what's happening at your institution related to OER? Anybody? Oh, come on, somebody share their story. <laughs> There's more coffee at the end of the room. <laughs> Coming down your way here. <laughs> Linda, I just want to say I had a your story at the end there. I had something that similar happen. And students, students uh, in the second week of class, like you know, I can't afford my textbook, and there were a few of them. The textbook didn't seem expensive to me, so I just went and bought a couple of copies. But then I realized, you know, long term, that's not something I can keep doing. It's just buying four or five copies of a book, even if it is under a hundred dollars. Um, so I really love your emphasis here on, you know, not just open access as like this great research research tool or, you know, uh, getting your courses aligned with your, your research. That's kind of what I have often thought about with OER is getting my research agenda into a textbook, right? But uh, really focusing on those students and how we can serve them. So thank you so much for this. I'm your way. How did you make sure that your administration bought in and supported? Well, uh, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but, I don't know. The Zoom people yeah. will need to be. Sorry, we got some. <laughs> Actually, it was the chancellor that approached me and asked me if I could do it because because I had worked in that bookstore prior to working for the college. Uh, he knew I was passionate about helping students. Uh, I mentioned the one student in the bookstore. It wasn't unusual for me. I, I was a student also, and I did have financial aid, and it wasn't unusual for me to use my own financial aid to buy these students' books, and he was aware that I was doing that. So he came to me, and it's something that he was very passionate about. Uh, we have we've spoken at some conferences and done some roundtables when he was with me, and you know he talked to the administration about that too, and that that really helped. Any other questions, comments? There's some online. Yeah. And again, thank you to those that are online and chatting because I've been trying to respond and we've been having some good dialogue there. Uh, I want to scroll back up here. And yeah, so we had a couple of colleagues from Southeastern actually that commented in the chat. And we have a couple here in the room, which I think is awesome too. Uh, they said that Southeastern student body is generally low income. So not having to buy an expensive textbook is really appreciated. Not having a textbook to purchase can also make the difference in somebody enrolling in your class or not, uh, at least at that institution, which I think is a very valid point. I'll also give a shout out to the session that's happening in a little bit about course marking at Oklahoma State University, which is a great strategy to incorporate if you have OER and want to help your students discover courses that are using them. Uh, that's an interesting data trend to follow if you start marking courses over a couple of years, but see which courses do students choose if they have that information at their disposal. Um, we're also, I'm part of a work group that's at the national level, even about how to do that in the best way. How do you communicate the cost of materials to students using your systems that you have? Uh, Jayanna from Southeastern also commented that the Southeast Library does have a small textbook collection, and unfortunately, they can't afford to buy all the textbooks, and many digital textbooks, such as college algebra, require assignment. So OER really is the best solution to saving students money and opening access to those course materials. And I think that that's a good point to bring up too about this 
digitization of resources that's happening. I know I uh, taught before using McGraw Double Connect, for example. Um, that presents some issues, you know, for students. Even if we provide them an opportunity to opt out of purchasing that textbook, what does that do to their experience, for example, within the rest of the course? Are they going to have the same quality of learning experience with those alternative assignments or instructional materials as the students who really were able to pay and get that robust content uh, that the course was designed upon? I think those are really good questions and people are using use cases there. Um, and again, just to thank you also on the bottom, Melinda, for what you shared here. It's, it's a great resource. Thanks. And and I do want to, I think someone over here had a, who was that question. Um, I see that OER is an excellent resource to turn to for cost saving for students on textbooks. <clears throat> but for the courses that haven't done that on your campus, how do you keep up with the supply and demand for the physical textbooks for the kids on campus? And for how do you? provide resources for the online community as well. We do have a lot of online students. Um, we do everything at our ERC. We have an ERC on each campus, uh, so that's convenient to students. And the way we work our program, I mentioned that I buy the books uh, from Amazon uh, or wherever I can get them, uh, even if it's one at a time. And uh, the instructors send the adoptions to me so that I know which textbooks to get. The students know to come to the ERC if they live 60 miles or more away from any of the campuses. We ship the book to them. It doesn't cost them a dime. It's just the $30 rental. Uh, I send a label uh, to return it so they don't have to worry about that either. Uh, so that that's the way we handle that. We just we're small enough, we have about 1,500 students, so we're small enough that we can really keep up with them. Any, any follow-up? Uh, I do want to mention that if any of you are interested in learning more about how we did this, or you'd like to try it, I have some cards. Uh, Brad will have my contact information. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, you can get me through email. And I will answer you and do anything that I can to help. I've traveled to some other schools and help them try to get something like this started. So I'm happy to do that. Thank you. I do have one comment though that I would like to add. Not that if I need it, I can talk loud. <laughs> That's mostly the virtual people. We want to make sure they hear. My name is Stephanie. I'm from Cameron. And one of the things that um, we worked with faculty um, with OER was the actual. Um, the inventiveness of it, thinking outside the box. And so some of it was pulling open resources and then customizing it themselves. From a student's perspective, we've gotten a lot of feedback saying that they love OER because we've taken out a lot of um, text material, the reading, and we focus on just the content. And they're a lot more apt to read what we're providing them in some of the courses. And so I think we're seeing um, that are retention with the reading materials that we assigned because it's not all of this other material. The other thing I'd like is the ancillary. So like pictures that we actually, at least for our online students, we may actually take pictures of a lab and they actually see videos, pictures of actual students that come from that university and, they're, and that builds that community as well. And so I've really enjoyed the flexibility of that, plus the relevancy up to date. Um, resources that we're using, and I can't wait to see the AI one because we dabbled a little bit with that. Okay, that's all we have. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Simone State, and I would just like to say another way that people can do something like this if they're not ready to textbook is about 15 years ago, we were using a custom reader, and we were in the third edition, and I was like, look at how many of these stories are, are out of copyright, Plato, and all that. Why are we paying Pearson? To it, right? And so we just started setting up, and I maintain a, a website that's our e reader. And faculty, if they've got something, they give it to me. I put it in a common format, PDF it, and put it up on there. And it's just open for anyone in our department to go to and assign students. 
So if a textbook might be really overwhelming, there's ones, again, take the readings out because those cost. Um, and you can do that and then provide links to those things for the students. So that's when we started looking at OER. Uh, we're not doing anything else at this point, but very interested. Yeah, that's a great idea. Great and, and that's, that's a, those are examples of academic freedom. Uh, the things you can do, you can take different, you can take different material and put it together, and and that is academic freedom. That's what it's about. Sorry. Anything else? One more comment in the chat. There's one more comment in the chat. Um, Southeast textbooks are scanned for online students. They can scan up to one chapter per day per request. Scans are typically done for IL materials as well. If we could scan a material for IL or another university, we would definitely scan it for one of our own students. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to take a moment to highlight some of the initiatives that are happening here within our own system that I know many of you, especially those that are part of the Cole Open Educational Resources Committee are familiar with. Um, So initially, the Open Educational Resources Projects, and from the next with that, so our support for open educational resource initiatives within the Oklahoma State System of Higher Education was initially started through the online consortium of Oklahoma. We have many individuals here today that are part of member institutions of OCO and also some steering committee members that are here today that guide what the consortium does and how we're investing our funds. OCO was actually started in 2018 by the state regions as a special project group and collects membership dues from participating institutions across the state. We actually have 26 member institutions that are part of OCO contributing towards open educational resources and other digital learning initiatives to really help us grow across the state. And so OCO, the steering committee, actually set aside an initial investment of $15,000 a couple of years ago for us to try out projects with open educational resources and start to give grants out to faculty to work on these projects to incentivize not only the time, but the expertise and just work that goes into completing this if you decide to make that conversion in your course to OER. Our board at the state regents took note of that investment and the successes, and we were very fortunate during fiscal year 24 uh, this last year, 23, excuse me, uh, to actually receive $300,000 of support for open educational resource initiatives to use across our system. We did a lot of things with those funds in the first year, and I'll admit that we really did not maximize the funds that we had at our disposal, even though we were able to have a focus impact with the opportunity that we had. We specifically allocated $235,000 of those funds to go towards the kinds of faculty incentive stipends that Rolinda was talking about at UA Casa earlier. Initially, we only it's, uh, issued out $71,500 of the $235 that was available this last year. But I'll tell you, the impact was quite measurable on that small amount of funds. We saved students a collective $2,300,000 a year. Uh, that we've actually calculated, and that's the minimum amount because we're still collecting some data on the cost of materials with the grants that were issued. We're impacting over 25,000 students just with the $71,000 that was issued out with those funds. We worked on over 60 course projects that were impacted by those grants, and I'll talk about some of the opportunities and levels that are available here in just a second. And I believe that it was 13 of the institutions across our system. There are a total of 27 that can officially count. So again, a little under 50% that took advantage of the grants that were available. Um, but again, the message that I got out of it is, whoa, <laughs> so $10,000, $2,300,000 of impact. And I can tell you that when I have an opportunity to share the work that we've done just with that small amount of funding, People are taking note and they're asking what's working about this and what can we do to make sure that it continues to grow. 
So this year, which is fiscal year 24, we were given another renewal of the $300,000 in funding for educational resources and made $190,000 of that available again for faculty OER grants. We did a calculation yesterday and we still have over 100,000 remaining in these grant funds available for faculty teaching at your institutions to do this kind of work. You all should have received a flyer that contains the information about the grant opportunity that we have available. And again, Relinda and their institution mostly focus on adoption of existing index. And so we have grants that support that kind of, I don't want to say lower level work because it's still work that goes into it. Uh, but adopting a, a textbook with minimal modification, we will incentivize that. That's great. Yeah, we also have, and that's a $500 grant, by the way, for a whole adoption that's available for your faculty. If you have an opportunity, and I have personally been on this kind of a project, of course, I taught at UCO to use more than one book that you want to combine together and make into a new resource that aligns with the learning outcomes of your course more specifically, while again, not costing students anything. We are now offering $1,500 for that particular kind of project. So um, again, remix and revision is what that's called, $1,500 there. If you are a real eager beaver and want to fully author your own textbook or share your resources that you have curated and created with a Creative Commons license so that other faculty can use it and adapt it, you'll have the opportunity to earn $3,000 for that particular type of grant or faculty again that you're working with will have that opportunity. We are also encouraging collaborations between faculty working at the same institution, teaching the same course, or even faculty across institutions that teach the same class but might want to work on an OER project together. So we have a $500 collaborator grant that's available as an add-on to any of those other three levels that I described, where up to three additional faculty can work with a primary awardee on their project and receive the $500. The last one that I'll mention is that we did add another bonus kind of add-on or standalone opportunity for this year for ancillary materials. That really is where a lot of the weight can come in for faculty that choose to adopt an open educational resource textbook. It may be a pretty easy lift for them to pick a book off of open stacks, human learning, whatever else that may be, library resources that are in the open domain. But there is $500 of a stipend available for them to create ancillary materials that they would be willing to share with other faculty. So my biggest call to action, <laughs> request for a favor from you all today, is I really want to go to our board and report 100% utilization of these grant funds. And we have another month of open application opportunity for faculty to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. December 1st is the deadline. So after that, we're going to cut the applications off and we're going to take the remaining funds and apply them towards other purposes to support your institutions. But I really want to make sure that we get faculty converting their courses to OER as much as possible. Tracy, who is our wonderful advocate. Big round of applause for Tracy. So Tracy is having weekly consultation meetings available for your faculty. So they can sign up, talk in the meeting setting, which usually has anywhere, I think, from three to sometimes 10, uh, depends on the day, people signing up there to talk about this opportunity and find out what is required to get started. And just so you all know, the grants are available for faculty that are teaching in fall, so right now, spring or summer, and using an open educational resource textbook as the primary instructional content for their course. Um, to get paid for the grant, all that we have faculty submit to us is verification of adoption. So that can either be a copy of your syllabus or a screenshot of the bookstore verification page that indicates there's no cost of materials and will disperse their funds in one of two windows that will occur during the spring semester. We are also taking data and asking our faculty that work on these grants to submit a final project report. But we're asking for a lot of really good and useful information outside of just what were you saving your students. That's not what we just care about with OER. I care, I think, even more so these days about the learning outcomes and how we can align instructional content with our objectives and not have it go the opposite direction, which I think sometimes happens when we use resources like McGraw-Hill, Pearson, whatever that may be. So once again, the grants are available. December 1st is the deadline. Over $100,000 for your faculty to accomplish this work. We have many individuals in here who are also awardees. Would you actually raise your hand if you've received one of these awards this year or last? So again, thank you all for being here. 
talk to these people, if they're the ones who have done this work, uh, if you're concerned, or if you're curious about the opportunity to know what it looks like, talk to the OER librarians who are also here today. I'd like to give a round of applause to them. The OER librarians and instructional design colleagues will oh. be your best friends when completing this process because they will merge the curation elements, alignment of resources with your objectives, and also empower your creation capabilities with technology, which again is one of the best elements of OER. I hope you all enjoy the conference today. Enjoy the brief break that we have before the next session start and really dig into what's happening with these other sessions because really what I saw with the proposals that we had submitted are all of these elements that come together that can make OER great and also lift some of the weight off of faculty as they decide to take this work on. So thanks for being here. Enjoy the food. Eat a lot today. <laughs> Not a lot of food. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>